actually a little woozy today. Uh, on my way here, I come from Deep Creek, and I passed Sumter, and I went all the way to River Road. You never want to do that. <laughs> it is a long ride, especially if you're late. And, uh, I mean, it's nice scenery. I saw a deer, and I'm like, a deer, that's nice. Where's Sumter? <laughs> so I had to text Michael, but uh, I didn't realize uh, how tiring grieving is. So if you haven't heard, I lost my dad um, this past Thursday night, and uh, it was hard, but it was good. You say, how can that be good? Well, it's good to know that my dad knew the Lord, and he's with my brother Mark, and he's with so many saints from freedom, and it was good to feel God's presence. It was good to feel God's peace. It was good to bond with my family as God was with us the entire time. And I just pray for my mom, who's going to be home by herself now and have to get used to that. But she is, she might be the strongest Christian I know. And I'm not saying that because she's my mom. She's just, she's an incredible lady. So um, my son Nathaniel spoke last week. And I think if you've ever heard Nathaniel preach, you know if something happens to me, we're going to be in good hands. Matter of fact, His sermon was so good last week that every time I go to a stop sign now, I make sure I look extra. I'm not going out in a lightning storm, anything like that, (laughs) because, but his time will come when it's God's time. So, so today we, if you're new, we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. We're going through Romans and John last week. Uh, Nathaniel was in Romans, so today we're in John, where we left off, in John chapter 9, talking about this amazing miracle of Jesus healing uh, a beggar that was born blind. Now, I've titled it, Only the Blind Can See. That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, it will. I'm talking about spiritual blindness, and only when you realize you're spiritual blind and come to Jesus, can he make you see? All through Scripture, blindness is used as a spiritual metaphor, as an inability to see and understand truth. Jeremiah, Prophet Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 5.21, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but but hear not. Isaiah talks about this. Ezekiel talks about this. Says the same things. There are people that are blind. There are people they can't hear spiritually. Matthew 13, Jesus talks a lot about spiritual blindness. Uh, He tells parables and the disciples are like, why do you tell parables? And and, and uh, Jesus said, well, I tell it because the blind won't understand it. They don't want to hear it. But those who want to hear it will come to me, and I will explain it to them. And he also says they don't understand it because they don't want to understand it. He says it this way, verse 15 of Matthew 13, For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Jesus said if they wanted the truth, if they wanted their eyes open, if they wanted their ears open spiritually, I would heal them, but they don't want it. Matthew 15, verse 14, Um, Jesus, the the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, you offended the Pharisees. (laughs) And, you know, you would think Jesus said, oh, gee, I'm so sorry, right? Um, But I offend somebody, I like chase after them, try to be nice, try try to apologize or talk to them or reach them. But Jesus said this to the disciples, verse 14, he says, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. 
You ever wonder, there's a saying in our world, the blind leading the blind. People don't even know that's a Bible verse. And you've got blind people saying that verse about other people, and they don't even know they're the blind ones. So that's the scary thing today. Hear me if you have ears to hear. The scary thing is people who are blind don't know they're blind. And so God has to open your eyes. And if you think you're blind, you might need to ask God today to open your eyes and to open your ears to hear his truth. Second Corinthians, now we get to the Apostle Paul. He says it this way in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, he says, in their case, he's talking about unbelievers, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What is Satan up to today? If you're wondering, you know what he's doing? He's keeping people blind. Blind from what? Blind from the truth of Jesus Christ. That's why Satan works so much in false religion. Because people think they're okay because they're religious. But they don't know Christ. So Satan loves it if you're religious. That's why we have all these false religions in our world. And blind people say, well, it doesn't matter what religion. What? That, that's, people that are blind say that because Satan has them blinded so they don't know that Christ is the only way. So I just want to finish this story of the blind man and just read through it. And I think the Holy Spirit will help you see a little bit about spiritual blindness. And then we'll take communion together and thank God that he's opened our eyes. All right? So if you haven't been here, John 9, we opened it up. Jesus sees a blind beggar uh, sitting on the road begging. And the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither. This man was born blind so the works of God might be displayed in his life. So that's good for us to know. And some of you don't realize, some of you, things that you go through, you're like, why would God put me through this? Why did this happen? Why am I going through this sickness? Why? Because God allows it so he can display his work in your life. Sometimes he allows it so he can get your attention. It's the only way to get your attention. So that's why there's suffering. And so this man's blindness was a gift to him that he would come to God and find God. Maybe you're, what you're going through is God's gift to you. You don't see it as a gift, but it's a gift to draw you to him. And uh, so anyway, Jesus spits on the ground. He, he makes some mud with the spit. He rubs it on the man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man obeys and he does. And he receives his sight. So Jesus is the creator, right? He created man out of dirt. But I think, like I said last time, I think he spit on the ground because the Pharisees had a law. You weren't allowed to spit on the Sabbath because it might make some mortar. I think Jesus did it just to make them mad, just, just so they'd see how foolish it is. But it, it would draw people to Christ. So now the guy can see all his neighbors are freaking out. They're like, is that him? No, that can't be him. And, and they're like... They go and tattletale to the Pharisees. Hey, you guys better check it out because this guy, this is the guy we think was blind and now he can see. Well, the Pharisees don't like that. They don't like Jesus. So they, they want to investigate. So here they come. Dun, 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 dun. Here come the Pharisees. <laughs> and they, they, first they come to the man and they say, who, who made you see? And the guy's like, I don't know. I couldn't see him. He's the man. It's the man. But his name's Jesus, and he, he told me to put, put, he, he put mud on my eyes, and he told me to go wash, and now I can see. And they huff and puff. They're mad at him. So 
they don't like it. They go and talk to his parents. His parents are afraid. They should be thankful, too, that their son that was born blind was healed. They're more worried about getting kicked out of the synagogue. They're more worried about themselves, so they don't speak up, and they don't give any information. They say, go talk to our son. You ask him. So here's where we left off. Let's look at verse 24 of John 9. It says, so for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. So what is this they're calling Jesus a sinner? They don't want to believe that he's a prophet or the Messiah or he's doing the work for God because the people are coming and listening to him and Jesus is exposing their hypocrisy. So they want, they want to, let's call this man a sinner. And the man just gives them common sense, truth. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. So, you, so there's obvious truth, right? Common sense. You, is this gonna, did they think, okay, did they think about it? No, watch what they say, verse 26. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? (laughs) Love that. This guy's getting brave now. I mean, he can see, and he also is perceiving with his eyes and seeing more and more that these Pharisees that didn't even let him worship because he was blind in the synagogue, there's something up with these guys. They're not right. And he begins to see it. And, of course, this upsets them, so they say to him in verse 28, says they reviled, reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. You know, we're the, we're the high and mighty disciples of Moses. They're so arrogant. They're so prideful, see? This is why they're blind. They don't think they need Jesus to give them spiritual sight. They think they already have it. And they're stuck in their hard-heartedness and their blindness. Verse 30 of John. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, he does his will. God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. I love it. He just gets braver and braver. And he's speaking truth here. He's speaking common sense. Guys, if he wasn't from God, he couldn't do anything. And back to them saying they're the disciples of Moses, Jesus already tried to tell them, I spoke to Moses from the burning bush, because before Abraham was born, I am. But they didn't have ears to hear it. They didn't want to see it. (laughs) So here he is. He speaks truth. He gives them common sense. You think maybe they'd say, yeah, well, yeah, you know, you got a point there. Do you think they might do that? Oh, no. Watch what they do. Verse 34. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. You were born in utter sin. They're slandering him. You were born blind. You're a sinner. You don't know God. That's why you were born blind. And you're going to teach us, the high and mighty? And they cast him out. That, that, that means they didn't just say, get out of here. Cast him out. They casted him out of the synagogue. You are no longer a part of our synagogue and our system, 
our religious system. <laughs> what a blessing, <laughs> right? What a blessing to be, have these guys kick you out and you don't have to deal with them anymore. I would have loved it. Count me into that. And, and so this is, this is just sad. This is just sad. Isn't it, you see this going on in our world? Whenever you try to tell someone truth, they don't want to hear the truth. And when you give them the truth and explain the truth and you try to make it clear and they can't answer, they don't have an answer back. What do they do? They call you a name. That's the new thing. They just call you a name because they don't want to hear the truth. And, and that's, that's, they think they win. But in the end, they won't. So, okay, here comes the good part. Here comes the good part of the story. Verse 35, John 9. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Now, first off, don't miss this. Jesus found him. Jesus came looking for him. That's spiritual truth right there. You, you might say, hey, I found God back in something. No, you didn't. God found you. Jesus finds you. He has to come get you. Jesus says that the shepherd leaves the 100. He leaves the 99, and he goes after the one lost sheep. And if you're one of his sheep, and he knows you have good soil to believe, he will come and find you. That's a beautiful thing. And then he asks him the most important question anyone can ask you in the history of the world. He doesn't say, hey, uh, how do you like your new site? How's that going? He doesn't say, man, I heard about the Pharisees, you know. They kicked you out of the synagogue. Man, those guys. Now, he doesn't even say, he just goes right into, do you believe in the Son of Man? Son of Man, this blind man would have heard that. I'm sure maybe he still went to school when he was a little boy. And every Jewish child learned that the Son of Man was the Messiah. It was in Daniel 7. And this is why Jesus called himself Son of Man. So they would all know he's claiming to be the Messiah. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And, and he says, who, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. It's like this guy... He goes from he knows Jesus is a person because he dealt with him. Jesus opened his eyes. He knows he's something special. He told the Pharisees, this guy has to be from God. He's a prophet. But now he's going to find out who Jesus really is, that he's the Messiah, but he is God himself. And Jesus says, you, you're looking at him. You want to know who the Son of Man is? You're looking at him. The one who made you see. The one the Old Testament said when Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind physically. But that was to show the true reason he came, to open people's eyes spiritually. In the best verse in the chapter, John 9, 38, he said, Lord, I believe and he worshipped him. So now he's there. He's not, he's not just a guy that thinks Jesus is something special. He knows that he's the Lord. The word for Lord is God. And he worshipped him. Only God gets worship. Scripture is clear. Jesus doesn't say, hey, get up. I'm Michael the archangel. I'm, uh, I'm just a good teacher. No, the, he lets the man worship. Why? Because he's God. He's God. And so 
I love that. And I, w- I want to I wanna say to you in here today, you might say, maybe you've been new at this, maybe you've been coming, you've been listening, and you're like, well, how do I know if I'm a Christian? How do I know if I'm truly saved, as you guys keep talking about being saved, saved from your sin? How do I know if I'm in? You're, you, you see it all right here. You see salvation right here, how it all works. Jesus comes and finds you. Have you noticed Jesus has been drawing you to him with whatever's going on in your life? So you got that. You begin to, your eyes begin to be open. You begin to wonder who Jesus is. And as you continue to hear about him, you start to believe. And then when you fully surrender your heart and believe, what do you do? You worship him. And we've got all this sentimental Christianity going on all over the place. It's it's prideful. It's sentimentalism. And where people just, it feels good. I I went to a Christian concert, and I I felt good, and I walked down the aisle. and, And or somebody says, yeah, I prayed this prayer one time, a long time ago, and and I know I'm a Christian now. And and but these people don't worship. They don't worship God. Worship is, means your entire life. Worship isn't just coming and singing songs. I mean, that's part of it. That's a start. You will have a desire to do that. I hope that's why you're here. But worship is your entire life. You want to worship him. You want to serve him. You want to follow him. You want to please him. And he transforms your heart. And then you love that, and you grow in that. And you start talking different. Why do you start talking different? Because that's what God wants. I didn't change the way I talked to become a Christian. I changed the way I talked because I was a Christian, and it was an act of worship. God, I'm not going to say these things. It's an act of worship. When you stop going to places, you know God doesn't want you to go. And doing things God doesn't want you to do, you don't do that to become a Christian. You do that because you are a Christian. And you say, no, I want to please God. I want to worship God. I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. Worship is your entire life. And so that's what I would say to you. How do you know you're truly saved, truly a Christian? You worship. You worship. Do you worship the Lord. And then the final verses say this. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. This is why I came. I came to open the eyes of the blind. This whole story is about spiritual blindness. And Jesus is saying, if you're spiritual blind today, he came to open your eyes so you can see, so you can hear. And then he says, and those who see may become blind. Wait a minute. Jesus already said they're already blind. But the point is, it becomes official. You claim you can see and you reject Christ, you will, you will be blind forever. And in total darkness, separated from God. Verse 40, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? If I was one of the disciples, I would have went, yeah. (laughs) But Jesus says better things. He He says this. He said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see your guilt, remains wow what does he mean by that he means you guys you've seen the truth you've got the truth standing right in front of you you have God in the flesh teaching you trying to tell you the truth he's performing miracles that the old testament said the messiah would do right before your eyes you see all that but you don't want to believe, so your guilt remains. 
You are responsible for your sin. And if your guilt remains, we talked about, Jesus talked about it, you will die in your sin. You will die in your sin. So, this is so important. Helen Keller, the famous woman who was born deaf and blind, said this. When someone asked her about her blindness, how it's sad that she's blind. And she says, it's better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. Good point. Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby, the great hymn writer. Um, She wrote over 5,000 hymns. She's attributed to like 9,000 hymns. She said this, someone asked her, it's so sad that you're blind. God's blessed you so much, but it's so, and she says this, if I had a choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first place I will ever, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. Wow, this lady, this lady was blind, but she could see. And you can see it in her hymns. She loved Jesus, she wrote the song, Blessed Assurance, one of my favorite hymns. Uh, Worship team, pastor's got a request. We need to sing Blessed Assurance, okay? All these hymns are coming back, so we might as well bring it back. It's awesome. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That's written by a blind lady. She can see. She can see. Do you see? I'm not asking if you have physical eyes. Do you hear? Jesus would often say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I probably should say that after every sermon. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if you can't see and if you can't hear, the only person that can open your eyes spiritually and open your ears is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other way. So I want to put the words of amazing grace up here for a second. This might be the number one all-time hymn, right? Everybody knows it. As a pastor... For about 40 years, I see this song everywhere. I see it at funerals. I see it, uh, I, they, they play it with bagpipes. They, they, sing it at, they sing it at weddings. Uh, the political, there have been political events, and they play Amazing Grace. Everybody loves Amazing Grace, but here's the thing. Do they really can they really say it and mean it? Because a lot of people are just hearing the tune and they like the song and it's touching. But can they really say these words? Look at the first stanza. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Can you say that? Are you a wretch? If you don't know, I'll tell you, you are. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. Uh, people can't say that. What do you mean I'm a wretch? Well, I'm not as bad as you. As some, some guy I went to high school with tell, telling his family member. He's like, I don't need to go to that church. I knew Frank Vargo. I knew Frank Vargo. That, that guy was wild and crazy. In other words, he was a wretch. Well, I'm not a wretch. I'm one of the good guys. I've got my education. I got all this. I don't need to go. And he's trapped in his blindness he doesn't want to see he doesn't see that he's a sinner and he needs salvation and and john newton says i was once lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see i've told the story of john newton i know there's a bunch of new people here from northport john newton who wrote this song was a slave trader yeah He kidnapped precious people and put them in chains and sold them for money. John Newton was a drunk. 
he got so drunk, he fell off his boat and his sailor buddies harpooned him and brought him in to save his life. He lived with a scar for the rest of his life. He was wild and crazy. One night, God put, God put his fear in John Newton. A storm came, a storm like never before. It was swiping over the boat. People were falling overboard. Newton remembered. He found a Bible. Somebody had a Bible along the way, and he kept it. Newton went in and read the Bible, and he prayed to God, and he said, God, if, if you're real, spare my life. God answered that prayer. God spared his physical life, and then guess what? Newton put his faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus gave him spiritual life. He became a transformed man. You know, he worked with Wilbur, uh, William Wilberforce to, to stop slavery. Uh, once a guy was a slave trader, now he worked to end it. He, was a, he became a pastor, and he wrote hymns. And he says, I was lost, but I'm found. I was blind, now I see. He went from living an evil, wretched life to worshiping his Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see? Can you say that? Can you say, I'm a wretch, or you like all these, well, I'm just not as bad as some people. I'm very educated. I do such wonderful things for the community. Why, I'm the grand poobah of the buffaloes, water buffaloes. I don't need to, I don't need to come to church and believe in this Jesus stuff. I'm good. Yeah. Blind. Blind. And they'll be blind forever if they don't come to Jesus Christ. I pray your eyes are open. I pray your ears are open. Let's bow in prayer before we take communion today. Uh, in a moment, after I pray, we're going to grab a communion. If you're new, there's a communion cup should be in front of you on the chair. Both, both the bread and the juice are together. We just open the bread first and we'll take it together, okay? But before we take communion, um, let's just have a quiet time of prayer. There's somebody, if you come in here today, you're visiting, I don't know, God brought you. Jesus, Jesus drew you here. It's his way of finding you. Drew you here. And I pray that he gives you ears to hear and eyes to see. And if you feel like you're blind, if you feel like you're lost, so many people feel that they... I talk to people as a pastor. Well, I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. I don't feel that I'm worthy of it. <laughs> that's the point. You're not. Nobody is. You're in a good place if that's you. If you think you don't deserve it. If you think you're too sinful. Because you know you need a Savior. And Jesus wants to save you. That's why he came. So you just have to accept it. And say, Lord, save me. Lord, open my eyes. Open my ears. Come into my life. I surrender my life. I want to worship you. And be a part of your family and your kingdom forever. And Christians, if you're here, I pray. You're so thankful now as we take communion and close with a worship song. That Jesus has opened your eyes. Because without that, you'd be doomed and lost forever. Father, bless our time of communion. We pray that you're pleased with our worship today. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to take this bread, little wafer, cracker, whatever you want to call it. Remember, it's just symbolic. Nothing special. This, this isn't going to do anything special for you. It's symbolic. It points and helps you to remember the one that was special. Uh, Jesus said, this is my body. It just means, what's body mean? This is my life. This is my life that I'm going to put on the cross 
in your place. I'm going to trade places with you. As a sinner, you deserve to be punished by God. God can't just overlook sin. He's holy and just. And you deserve to be punished, but I'm going to be punished in your place. So we take this and we remember that Jesus gave his life for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's take and remember. And then, of course, Jesus said, this is the blood of my covenant. This is not real blood. It doesn't become blood when I pray over it. Be blood. I can't do that. Okay, That's, that's all silliness. This is symbolic. This is symbolic. Um, so when you think of blood, what do you think of? You think of death. So when Jesus says, my blood, it's my death. My death in your place. I'm going to die in your place. And he took all of our sins upon himself. And only Jesus could do that. Only God could do that. Take all of our sins that should be, we should be punished for eternity and place it upon himself. Only he could do that, but he did it. But then he rose from the grave and conquered death. And he says, we will raise with him as well. It's, it's, it's just too good to be true. So we remember his blood is death for us. Let's take it and remember. And just commune, commune with God. That's what communion means. Commune with God. Thank God right now. Ask God to cleanse you from your sins. Ask God to help you grow. God, show me ways I can worship you and love you back for loving me. Father, bless these dear people that came to worship today. Pray your Holy Spirit woke, uh, worked on them. And God, I, I just pray that, that, that God, our church, would continue to be a lighthouse and continue to share the good news of the gospel. Thank you for opening our eyes. Help us to sing with our hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing together.